the glory to Thee. Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Lord in all places, and fillest all things, treasury of blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every sin, and save our souls, a good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, to ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic Jesus is King. Welcome to Preparation for the Holy Sacrifice. This is our weekly Guild family stream for all the Guild members to become a Guild member. Get the whole stream. Go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. This is where we give thanks for God's providential ruling over all the world and all the news during the whole week. We talk about all the controversies and whatever as we prepare to offer all these things to almighty God, surrendering to his will at the Holy sacrifice. So the first part of the show, we're going to be talking about the three different rights of the church, or there's far more rights, I should say, but we're, we're thinking only of the three major rights. We unfortunately must exclude many rights in order to get through all of them. Uh, as you may know, there's 24 different particular Catholic churches within the one Holy Roman and Catholic Church. And one of those 24 is the Latin Rite, under which includes the Roman Rite. And then the other 23 are Eastern Rites of various kinds. But the most major and dominant Eastern Rite is, of course, the Greek Rite. So at today's show, we're going to be talking about these topics. First of all, and most importantly, for our guild, I just want to promote once again our brother in Christ, Leo, guild member who's fallen on hard times. He's now facing homelessness, potentially, unless he raises the money that we're trying to raise for him. So if you go over here you can click on the link right now, uh, just over halfway raised. They still need $20,000 more to cover all their bills, avoid homelessness. Um, so please donate. Chip in anything you can, five, 10, 15, $25, 50, 100, anything you can manage to please help our brother in Christ, Leo and his family to avoid homelessness. We don't want that to happen. Please donate anything you can for Leo. Click the link below for Leo's family emergency. So if you want to know his story as well, get to know Leo a little bit. You can click the link to the podcast we did with him, learning a little bit about his story. It's uh, He definitely has a had a unique journey. He initially converted to Mormonism, and then he got into paganism, and then he became a hardcore Lutheran for a while. And then he looked into Eastern Orthodoxy before he finally came to the Roman Catholic Church and has been Catholic ever since. So please donate to Leo and his cause. We would really appreciate your help. So. 
here's here's the topics we're going to be talking a little bit about Pope St. John Paul II. I'm going to make a public public apology in response to a number of, number of my guild members who, uh, in their great charity, challenged some of the things I said, and I I do believe I've I've spoken excessively, which is always a danger if you talk and use words for a living. So I appreciate all of y'all's prayers and and support. So I'll, I'll make that little public apology um, at the end of our gospel portion. But number two, is the Antichrist no longer restrained? We're going to be discussing a recent article that I published over at 1 Peter 5, which I think really pr provided a very good um, traditional take on the Catacon, and it gives us a great deal to, to discuss heading into the U.S. presidential election, and in which I will discuss why I condemn Trump, and yet I'm still voting for him. And I'll talk about kind of what I went through there and, and my best guess as to the best moral possibility we can we can do here uh, as a, as me as a Michigander. And then we'll also talk about the Synod of Synodality, of course. That was uh, the big news in the church. We'll talk a little bit about that. So before we do that, first and foremost, we want to talk about the Holy Sacrifice. So what's interesting this week is so so first of all this this sunday is the fourth sunday after epiphany resumed but then it's the 24th sunday after pentecost in the byzantine greek catholic rite and then it is the 31st sunday tempus par annum in the new roman rite of paul the sixth so what's interesting is that the um the epistle for the fourth Sunday after, after Epiphany coincides perfectly with the 31st Sunday Tempest Per Annum, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what's really interesting is that, um, so if you read my book, Introdu Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholic, we discuss the fact that, as, as Scott Hahn says, the New Testament was a sacrament before it was a book according to the book. Let me say that again because it's so important. The New Testament was a sacrament before it was a book according to the book. What does the book say? This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. The institution of the Holy Eucharist, that is the New Testament, properly speaking. And then what happened was the traditional lectionary... There was a lectionary that had been developed at the time of our Lord. There was a lectionary for the synagogues in various regions. There were various traditions, some of which are lost, because we know that there were uh, very different forms of Judaism. There was all sorts of different sects of Judaism at the time of our Lord. You had, you had the Pharisees, but there was also tons of different Pharisees who were fighting against each other in terms of all their positions within the one Pharisee school. Then you obviously have the Sadducees, the Heronians, you also have the Essenes, you also have the Alexandrian Jews, which are much different regarding the Septuagint. Um, and so the ancient, but the ancient Roman lectionary that's contained in the Latin mass appears to be, appears to be uh, coming out of the Roman Jewish church. First of all, we can, we can note the most ancient lectionaries if they follow the canonical order that is contained in the New Testament canon, as it is printed, printed in Bibles. So there obviously there's an ordering, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Acts, then Romans. Romans comes first. Why is that? Obviously, as Roman Catholic, I would give the answer because Rome is the, pro the primary church there. But when we look at a lectionary, and the lectionary actually follows this canonical order, the thing that actually came first, as I said in the beginning, was the rite, the ritual, the cult, the the cultus, the the lectionary of the mass. That's what came first before the New Testament was even compiled. So the New Testament itself, the canonical ordering of the books, is based on more ancient lectionaries. And we see, so we see, there's two actual, there's two very ancient um, uh, uh, things that you can see in the ancient Roman rite. One is that. The Old Testament books and the epistles of St. Paul are read in their canonical order according to the traditional office of Matins. So there's a, there's a great deal of ordering. 
So, so one, one ancient Jewish tradition is the reading of the entire Torah every year. And this is still done by Orthodox Jews to this day. And they just go a continuous lectionary from Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so it's very traditional to read continuously through and go to the next book in the order, because that's what created um, the uh, order in the first place. And this is what makes creates our um, the annual liturgical Bible reader that we have our, our group that we read through the whole Bible every year. In, so in my book, we have the whole plan, but you can get this as well as a part of the group. So you can see this in the ancient Roman lectionary. There's a very ancient, uh, there's a very interesting coinc coinciding with the ancient Jewish feast days in the spring and in the fall. I'm talking about all the Yom Kippur, pa Pascha, Rosh Hashanah, and all those Jewish feasts that are, are still celebrated by Orthodox Jews, and even liberal Jews still celebrate those. But there's actually, if you look at the ancient Latin mass, there's actually, um, these the lectionary coincides with these. And so there's there's a correspondence which indicates the ancient nature of the, the Roman lectionary. But in terms of the gospel readings, the gospel readings seem to be selected by some ancient uh, tradition that it seems to have been now lost in terms of how they are chosen. And so it's very mysterious and very ancient. Now, there's another ancient lectionary, which also follows the canonical order, indicating that it's very ancient. And that is among the uh, the Byzantines. And in the Byzantine rite, uh, especially among the Slavs, the Slavic rite, because there's there's significant differences between the Greek rite and the Slavic rite. So the Russian Catholic Catholics of the Byzantine rite have significant differences in their rite with the Byzantine Greek Catholics. Um, but in terms of the gospel readings, the gospel readings are almost totally the same. And they read a continuous gospel lectionary, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is always read during Pas Paschal Tide, both in the ancient Roman rite and in the, actually all three rites that I'm discussing, the ancient Roman rite, the new Roman rite, and in the Byzantine rite, they all read St. John during Paschal Tide, which because St. John was the, uh, was the, the mystical gospel for, that was used for mystagogy, which is the catechesis of the uh, initiated, those who were preparing for baptism, and they they became uh, baptized. And then um, they went through mystagogy. So that was the catechesis after they were baptized um, through Paschal Tide. Wesley's, what's up, Wesley? Yes, happy all souls, happy all saints. Octave, it's a great, uh, I, I was just thinking about the progression of the fall liturgical festivals, how you have Michaelmas at the end of September and October has a few angel feast days. So we're thinking about the angels. And then we enter into the Holy Souls month and then we finally hit Advent. So it's the end time. So it's this sort of building eschatological period, just as uh, all of the, uh, you know, winter is coming on. So it's it's uh, fantastic. So, uh, Wesley, what's up, man? Uh, glad you're here. Um, so those are some of the aspects of the lectionary. Um, so I'm going to skip over the Latin mass right now. The, uh, in terms of the gospel reading of Latin mass, it is, um, the calming of the sea. Why are you fearful? O you of little faith rising up. He commanded the winds of the sea and there came a great calm, but the men wondered saying, what manner of man is this for the winds and sea obey him? This is Matthew 28, 23. Certainly a, a very powerful gospel message for all of us in our, our difficult times. It, it reminds me of um, this this new text by Dan Burke, Finding Peace in the Storm, Reflections on St. Alphonsus Liguori's Uniformity to God's Will, which is really great because he basically he, he reads through the entire text of St. Alphonsus and then he provides commentary. So he basically he, you have the text of St. Alphonsus, then he discusses it. So it's really great. Dan Burke is a great spiritual writer of our time. So uh, that's a great text. Um, now, in the Byzantine Greek, right, it's a continuation of that uh what was last week in the byzantine right saint luke's gospel the healing of the demoniac and the and the swine filled with demons and then we have the the very interesting story of the 12 year old girl and the 12 years of blood so 
the Jarius's daughter tells our Lord to go to uh, heal her, his 12 year old daughter. And at the same time, there's a woman with a 12 year uh, issue of blood. And so that means that when this, then this girl was born, whatever he, she was in, in Israel, this woman also began to have an issue of blood for those 12 years. So there was this correspondence between these two women, these, this girl and this woman, and then they lived their lives for 12 years and then they met Jesus, which changed their life. So it's, it's just a fascinating kind of look uh, of corresponding together. So that's the Byzantine rite. So in the uh, 31st Dominica Tempus Paanum, that is the, the Novus Order, right? The new rite of, um, of Paul the sixth. It is the uh, the greatest commandment. This is the this is the gospel reading when our Lord is asked, "What is the greatest commandment?" And He says, "Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind." He's quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy six, and then He quotes Leviticus as the second greatest commandment: "Love your neighbor as yourself." And this corresponds with the Latin Mass epistle, which is from the from uh, Romans. If there be any other commandment, it is compromised in this word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The love of our neighbor worketh no evil. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Now, this is a very, you know, as Christians, this, this we kind of take this for granted. But if if you take this for granted, go search on the internet. Go, go search the Jewish virtue of hate. It's a first things article written by a rabbi. And the rabbi is explaining that there's actually a virtue of hatred where you hate your enemies, you hate people, you hate other people. Um, and that's their interpretation of the law. That's their inter interpretation of the Old Testament. You know, this is Orthodox Judaism right here. And so it's not, it's not apparent that love is the fulfillment of the law, but this is the message of Christ. This is critical, obviously, and, you know, creates a vast chasm between the Orthodox Jews, the, the post- messianic the um you know the rabbinic jewish tradition orthodox jews to this day you know we have so much in common with them obviously you know sharing the old testament and believing in the god of israel but you know many of them believe in this virtue of hate whereas that's completely sinful to to have that um as a christian and that's what's so critical is that our lord takes the shema and orthodox jews also pray the shema that's central to them. But what then happens is the Orthodox Jews, they have um, traditionally, they count the commandments as 613 commandments in the, in, in, the, in the whole Torah. That's how they count them. But the Lord counts differently. The Lord Jesus says, Shema, the Shema is the first and greatest commandment. And the second great commandment is from Leviticus. I believe it's 18, chapter 18 that he's quoting from, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the other greatest commandment. But then our Lord ups the ante in the Sermon of the Mount because then he says, love your enemies, because that was not contained in the law of Moses. But our Lord is interpreting the law of Moses as a rabbi of his day, authoritatively refuting the Pharisaic tradition, yet building upon it. Because they are when you compare the Pharisaic tradition as, as contained in the Talmud and our Lord's teachings, there's actually a, a great uh, overlap. So, so our Lord is critiquing the Pharisees throughout the Gospels, obviously, but there's actually a great correspondence in terms of all the different schools of thought, which indicates that our Lord was sort of uh, a member of that same stream of Pharisaic thought. Um, so, for example, the Talmud condemns, also condemns the Pharisees. It says there's seven types of Pharisees and all of them are a plague, but one. Uh, and, and so there's, and, and they condemn the various things that our Lord condemns, like in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. The Talmud says very similar things. And there's other factors to this. You can go and uh, watch our guild stream. It currently has like 18 hours of content discussing the Jewish question, Jews, Judaism, and Israel, all these different complexities. But I wanted to quick touch on this very interesting teaching from St. Thomas because um, the commandment is love your, so love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, et cetera, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is interesting because it brings up the fact that you have to love yourself. And there's an interesting uh, comment here from St. Thomas in the Summa. This is from Secunda Secundae, question 25, article four. Let me just put this up on the screen here. A man is one with himself. So quoting here from St. Thomas, a man is one with himself, which is more than being united with to another. Hence, just as unity is the principle of union, 
So the love with which a man loves himself is the form and root of friendship. Now, there's an interesting, this is the um, objection and reply. So this is, this is one objection that he makes to himself. He says, quote, a man deserves to be blamed for loving himself since it is written, 2 Timothy 3, 1. In the last days shall come dangerous times. Men shall be lovers of themselves. Therefore, a man cannot love himself out of charity. St. Thomas replies, those who love themselves are to be blamed insofar as they love themselves as regards their sensitive nature, which they humor. This is not to love oneself truly according to one's rational nature, so as to desire for oneself the good things which pertain to the perfection of reason. And in this way, chiefly, it is through charity that a man loves himself. I, I, I bring this up because I think we're dealing with a lot of self-hatred. Because, you know, this is like the root of transgenderism or feminism. It's where a person, a woman hates herself, hates her womanhood. Or a man hates his manhood and wants to become a woman. It's like a self hatred there, and you have there has to be a rational loving of self. And and, and Catholics, we also have a, a self hatred, a sinful self hatred, uh, in terms of scruples. Like a scruples is an affliction of pride, where it's an excessive hatred, an excessive and prideful and sinful hatred of yourself. And there is a humility in receiving uh the mercy of god in accepting and loving yourself as god loves you in terms of receiving your identity as an image of god and then taking care of yourself saint paul has the the famous dictum about uh loving your wife as your own body and he says because no one uh disregards one's own body but nourishes and takes care of one's own body and so this is, I think, what uh, St. Thomas is trying to contrast here. There is a, a sort of a sensual love of self, which is where you're addicted to yourself. And this would be this would be like homosexuality is sort of an addiction to yourself. That at least, especially among men, I think there's sort of a narcissism. There's an addiction to yourself. Um, whereas transgenderism is is the defect. So we've got the excessive love of self, excess and defect in the in the Thomistic distinction here there's an excessive love of self a narcissism um this would also be a presumption in in catholics pious catholics would might deal with a uh the sin of presumption which is where you're putting too much trust in yourself excessive love of self and then there's the a defect of love of self where uh this would be like the transgenderism or the scruples like i, I hate myself so much i'm not worthy of the love of god i can't even receive the absolution of the priest and it's a pride and so there's there's it's kind of it's kind of tricky because I think many souls the devil really messes with us. Um, but it's interesting to consider the fact that the love of neighbor, uh, as St. Thomas says, he says that uh, a man loves himself or like a true rational love of self is the form and root of friendship. So that's it's just an interesting fact. So you need to understand and have a rational love of self in order to understand love your neighbor as yourself you love yourself you have to love your neighbor the same way and this is kind of the the same sort of thing as what he says when when he's talking about marriage loving uh considering that other person as part of yourself um and in the book of genesis we learn that we're all sons of adam daughters of eve as uh you know c.s lewis writes in narnia so there is a sense that we are one family in, in a true human fraternity, not the false kind. So that's all I had to say about that. Those are the gospels. So regarding Pope St. John Paul II, I just want to, so what I want to do here is I want to just comment real quick publicly, and then I'm going to uh, talk about some of the comments. We're going to quote from uh, some of the comments that we had in the guild that challenged what I was saying. Um, so basically what I said was, um, I said that it's modernist, to have a uh, sort of a cancellation of, of John Paul II, a canceling of, of him as a person or as a, as a pope, as a saint. Um, the, the words here that, so I, I said, I had a public post about this, talked about kind of a modernist way of thinking of history that uh, Father Gregory Pine was mentioning in his podcast, which I thought was very well done. Um, but there was more that I said in the Guild stream 
uh, which we'll talk about in the um, in the, uh, the the guild portion of this. But I, I want to just concede the importance that I, I think many Catholics from all different streams. I mean, Gary Pine was doing this. Eric Sammons had a podcast about this. Um, Matt Frad recently discussed it with uh, Jason Everett. One of uh, Jason Everett is a a very a large devotee of John Paul II. And um, the I think a lot of people are 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 kind of seeing the the there's a totally rational and reasonable and charitable critique of John Paul II, or seeing uh, faults that he committed or p- potential sins that he committed. Um, and so that's that's totally re- totally reasonable. It's a, a reasonable thing to say. I I'm sorry that I I spoke excessively. I think it I think it's excessive to call that modernist. Uh, what I was attempting to do was to talk about uh, what seems to be a cancellation, like the cancel culture among the Catholic youth who who kind of had this attitude towards your elders or towards the previous generation or, you know, always talking about, OK, boomer or separating all the people into these different um, demographics, which is what the mark, the Marxist marketers do to us. They separate us into different generations. And um, I see this huge disconnect between the Catholic youth, like Gen Z or whatever, with the boomer Catholics, you know, and there's a huge disconnect and that disconnect is not Catholic. That disconnect is a very bad thing and we need to fight against it as best we can. And I was trying to fight against it, but I I think I was excessive. So I'm sorry that I was excessive with some of my language, Um, but I'm gonna explain a little bit more about that in the Gill stream and we'll quote some of y'all's comments about it. Um, But I want to, uh, address just one thing and um the the most substantial critiques of john paul ii that i've seen are from the sspx these two texts we've got um over here is the uh pope john paul ii doubts about a beatification uh by father patrick de la roque and um then we have this this four volume set so this is by um Ioannes dorman i believe it's translated from german and it's called Pope John Paul II's Theological Journey to the Prayer Meeting of Religious uh, in Assisi. And I have, so first of all, I have to concede that I have not gone through these texts totally yet, cover to cover. I will. Uh, but my impression thus far, looking into this and reading reading this text in particular, by page 26, I was very dissatisfied with what appeared to me to be a very superficial study of Vitewa. Uh, you know, to his, um, in fairness, Vitewa is extremely dense. He's notoriously dense. So even if you really do try to study him, it's easy to misunderstand him, I think. Uh, but if you're going to critique a Pope or critique a, a blessed or a saint, I think that there needs to be a much deeper analysis. Uh, we've talked about this in our guild, the guild series. There's six plus hours on the guild series. Guild members can access that. That's talking about Archbishop Lefebvre and Karol Wojtyla from their birth all the way to 1978. So that we haven't even gotten into his papacy yet. <clears throat> but um, we talk about the fact that there's a huge disconnect because there was a huge translation issue with Wojtyla's central text, which is person and act. The English translation for many years was very bad and it was way too phenomenological making him into this phenomenologist. And that's why that's a common misconception about him. But thankfully, um, uh, the uh, the new translator, Ignatic, um, Jagosh Ignatic, has created a much better translation now with all the Thomistic and metaphysical and Aristotelian distinctions and whatever he puts in there. Um, so anyway, so in fairness to the SSPX critique, there's certainly a, an issue, you know, it's, and this is George Weigel says this in his, in his uh, biography, you know, obviously, which is a hagiography really. Weigel says Wojtyla, he doesn't think that Wojtyla ever found exactly the the right terms to describe what he was trying to talk about, <laughs> which is like, wow, you know, he's really dense. He's hard to understand. So I, I get that. But at the same time, uh, if we want, you know, if the SSPX wants to say, hey, I think you should, you know, 
not don't believe the hype about Archbishop Lefebvre. Read his text, read his writings. I've got them on my shelf right here. We've got the complete works on Lefebvre, uh, et cetera. You don't want to give him a superficial reading. Good, fair enough. But let's not give John Paul a superficial reading then too. And so here's an example of what I mean by that. In that uh, what seems to be, as I said, I haven't read the entire text, but what seems to be the argument of both Rock and Dorman in their critiques is that um, the humanism of, of John Paul II was basically a universalism. And he they get this from Redemptor Hominus, his first encyclical, and which is where John Paul II really brings up the um, the Second Vatican II Council text where it says, when Christ became man, he united himself to every man. And if you if you read Sign of Contradiction, this was the uh, Lenten, um, the, the Lenten uh, retreat preached by Cardinal Wojtyla to Paul VI in the 70s before he became Pope. I think you find a much more sympathetic reading. I, so my, my concern is that it's superficial and it's not sympathetic. That's that's the problem to me. It's superficial and it's not sympathetic. You have to be deeper. You also be, have to be sympathetic, which means that, as St. Thomas says, any doubtful matters must be interpreted in, char in charity, unless it's unreasonable. So we're going to try anything that's doubtful about trying to judge another man as to his intentions or his teachings. We have to, anything that's doubtful and misunderstood, we should interpret it the best we can uh, in a most favorable light. Unless it's unreasonable to do so. And if we're forced by reason and evidence, then we, you know, we should interpret that in an unfavorable light. But that's, to me, that's the principle of judgment. You have to follow this method or else you're going to sin against charity. You're going to dishonor this man by saying something that's wrong about him or unsympathetic about him. We, we have to be merciful to others if we want the Lord to be merciful to us in our judgment. So here's sign of contradiction 102. And this is discussed further in uh, the series that I mentioned, the six hour series. Um, so he says, uh, by applying the category of the mystery to man, the conciliar text makes clear. So he's talking about that Vatican II text I mentioned. The conciliar text makes clear the anthropological, even anthropocentric character of the revelation offered to mankind in Christ. This revelation is centered on man. Christ fully reveals man to himself but he does so by revealing the father and the father's love. Now, let's just pause for a minute. Um, if you read Wojtyla's other text, this was the, the text Sources of Renewal that Wojtyla wrote as a cardinal when he was creating the Synod of Krakow, which was a huge success in the 70s as an anti-communist movement implementing Vatican II. He mentions how the first seven ecumenical councils Talk about the person of Christ. It's all about understanding the person of Christ. And therefore, uh, Wojtyla says, now the, the, the subsequent councils, especially at Trent and after, are dealing with what is man. Now we, we've understood the person of Christ. And now we're, we're, he is revealing to us who is man? We know who man is to a great degree, but Christ reveals man to himself in a much more deep way. Uh, in, in particular, he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love. Genesis 5 tells us that the image of God, the image of a of uh, you know, God begot uh Seth. Sorry, God begot <laughs> Adam begot Seth. In the image of him, he was born, is what Genesis 5 says. Therefore, we know that the image of God in particular represents sonship and then christ reveals the sonship of man the image of god in man as a son in that sense in his image not in the regenerated sense and this is important because uh the problem is that the sspx is saying that he's promoting universal salvation and that does not appear to be totally the case um especially i should mention dominus jesus this document from 2000 which appears to clarify to a great degree a lot of the what seems to be incautious excesses on John Paul II's part with the communism and interfaith dialogue, um, which seems to refute any accusation of 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 a uh, a universal salvation. But further, 
Wojtyla says, the revelation is no theory or ideology and consists in a fact. The fact that by his incarnation, the son of God united himself with every man because became man himself, one of us, like us in all things except sin, Hebrews 4. So Dorman and Rolk are claiming that means that John Paul II is saying that you don't have to be baptized, if I understand their critique correctly. But what does Wojtyla mean? Well, he explains it right in the next sentence. Jesus lived an authentic human life, and we know that the difficulties he encountered were such as to make him always and forever close to all who have to endure trials and sufferings in their own lives. End quote. So it, it does not appear that Wojtyla is claiming that you don't have to be baptized. What Wojtyla seems to be claiming is what the scriptures claim about he became truly man. And thus, he's united to us in the sense that he shares the same human nature, not because we don't have to be baptized. So this is just an example of what seems to be a superficial reading, a superficial critique. As I said, I, I, I can see that Devote was extremely difficult to understand. Fair enough. But I, I think we need a little bit more deeper analysis and a little bit more sympathy if we want sympathy for Lefebvre too. So that's, that's, my, that's my basic point. But now I'm going to read... Um, the Guild comments from Wesley, Katarina, and Sherry, uh, and we'll we'll just share those as well. And then we'll talk about other topics. We still have to get to the Antichrist. So stay tuned. Uh, if you want the full stream, you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. All the Guild members who are watching will be back in just a minute.